I'm here today talking with Ann Bowers of Indian Town Gallery on the Outer Banks of North Carolina. Ann has a very nice gallery, and uh, she's going to tell us a little bit today about how she puts on events in her gallery. So welcome, Ann. Um, events have come and, and gone, but basically through the years we have increased the events that we do and the regularity in which we do events. It didn't happen overnight, um, but basically trying to figure in something that could be – we're in a seasonal business, so it started off with how can we make something busy uh, to make the off-season work for us. And that was the beginning of it. And then it used to be that you could get by when it was – when the economy was a little different and all, when it was busy season here, which is the summertime – it was easy. You just opened your doors. People came in and threw their credit cards at you. Now it's it's different, and we feel that we have to have a major event, um, you know, several times during the course of the year. And we try to have one once a month. And in, in a conjunction with the major events, we also have little things that, that go on as well. So there's always something happening here at the gallery, which is very important, and something that also we have put into our advertising, you know, our catchphrase, there's always something happening at Indian Town Gallery. Come by and see. Well, that sounds good. So, and I know that from what you've told me, you most of your business is not from the local people who live on your island, but from people who are coming there to see what's going on on the island. Absolutely. It's a vacation uh, a tourist location. Probably 95% of our business is done by people who don't live here and about 5% for the locals. It's a 60-mile island, and it has less than 4,000 people that live here year-round. Okay. So when you're planning your event, what percentage of your events do you have planned out in advance? Like, do you have an event calendar, or are you the type of person who goes, oh, my goodness, I need some money, let me plan something on the fly, and you, you know, how how often do you know way in advance what you're going to be doing, and is there a difference in success when you plan something far ahead versus planning something at the last minute? Okay, and the answer is to, is both. We have an event calendar, and we have things that we do all year round that are expected. Uh, for example, this weekend we always have a trunk show, jewelry trunk show for Veterans Day. Uh, in we always have a Black Friday event. We always have an annual Christmas party, which will be our 14th Christmas party coming up on December 6th. Um, uh, art supply swap meet in April. We have five craft shows a year in our front yard, and we do those. And yes, we also do. Oh my God, we need money. We got to do something. Uh, for example, a couple months ago, you had suggested that we were our ring sales weren't what they needed to be, so we decided to have a ring event where we were going to close out all our rings at half price because we were going to bring in all new lines for next season. That was a huge success. Um, and it depends on if we see a line that is struggling. We may have a two-for-one uh, deal. For example, we had an earring line that did very well for us last year, and this year we had almost 100 pairs. We did a two-for-one, got the inventory down to 20 pairs on just that one line in just two weeks. And events, when you do something like that, have to have a beginning and an end. Um, big sales like doing uh, a sale at, um, oh, I guess it's um, St. Patrick's Day, that is a three-day event. But when we do something on the fly, we may do it for 10 days or two weeks because for us, every weekend we have a new group of people. So doing it for two weeks also has validity. And the event calendar works very well for us because it allows us to have long-term advertising. It allows for the customer to get it into their thought process. And it also helps uh, my team of employees here how to proceed um, as far as if, if they know what their schedule is going to be, what they can tell customers, what's coming up. It's, um, it really does help. Okay, so in your, in your gallery, what sort of event draws the largest amount of interest from the, the people who might be out there shopping? 
the biggest event that we have is we sponsor an arts and crafts show um, in our front yard uh, five times a year. We do it on Easter weekend, Memorial, somewhere around July 4th, Labor Day, and the last one is Columbus Day. And that's during the high traffic areas, and that works out very well for us. We have hundreds and hundreds of people that attend there. And of the artists, we try to keep it uh, kind of small and more boutique. There was a time when we had as many as 25 to 30 artists, which is the maximum our property can manage. But through the years, I have taken it down to uh, 18 to 22 artists, depending on the show, with Easter being the slowest of the shows. Because, you know, it makes it better if the pie doesn't get sliced too thinly. And this, of course, is once again in um, response to what the um, economy has done for us. I mean, we're all doing business differently. But we advertise that in every medium. We've been doing this for uh, eight years, I guess it is. Um, and people look forward to the shows. And not only do we have the artists outside who are promoting, their, you know, they have their own shop set up under a 10 by 10 tent out in the yard, but it also, whenever you can bring people onto the property, even though they might be selling and buying, doing business outside, you know, not part of the gallery, they're here. They're parking in our parking lot. They're seeing the building. They may not have been here before. They may have stopped because they were driving down the road and saw this hubbub of activity, and it's like, ooh, let's go investigate. And they're going to come into the gallery, and our biggest days have been uh, in conjunction with those shows. So do you, when you put those shows on, do you get a percentage of the sales of the artists, or do you charge them a fee to participate? We charge them a booth fee. Okay, you charge them a booth fee. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So you made reference a couple of times while you were telling us about that to promoting. So how do you promote an event like that or any other event that you might put on? Well, down here on the Outer Banks, um, TV works very well. Of course, like many, we do compete with um, satellite TV, but still 50% of the houses here, which is what people usually do when they come here. We have very few motels. People rent an oceanfront house or a soundfront house, and over 50% of these houses still use cable TV, and I have found TV to be the absolute most effective medium out there. People come into town, whether they've been here before or not been here, they're going to tune into the Weather Channel, they're going to look at the local news, they're going to try to immerse themselves in in what is here. And for as little as a dollar for a 30-second spot, that works very well, and I use TV advertising uh, year-round, believe it or not. Now with the explosion of Facebook, Facebook is just a tremendous thing getting as many friends or likes as you can on Facebook by whatever means you can, as long as they're viable customers, you can get the word out there in a day, and it is amazing. Uh, and so we use these events as well, and you can run it as either inviting people or just getting the word out there, but that is a, a tremendous way for reaching people. Another very successful thing that we do is we have our email um, customer list and we use constant contact and constant contact is just you know for I can manage my list for about sixty dollars a month it's white listed and everything is handled in a very professional manner and by staying in touch with people um, and actually I tend to use constant contact more during the shoulder seasons than the busy seasons because it's easy to get people to respond in the summertime but when I need to draw a response out of people, I can do it twice a month or even three times in the month of December where I may only run it, do a newsletter once a month in the summertime. And the other thing is we use flyers, um, which is very popular down here on the Outer Banks. And I also have um, road signs that I put out that are kind of look like the election signs that are little wires that go into the road. And I have 50 of those that I get a variance from the county government that allows me to put it up through the southern part of, um, so of the island. And they say, Art Show, Frisco, come see. And they're bright yellow, and people follow the signs. And we get hundreds and hundreds of people to an event, which is difficult to do here given the smallness of the island. 
Right. So one of the things that uh, I noticed that you said was that you could advertise on TV for as little as a dollar for a 30-second ad? Yep, if you get it in a contract. If you get it TV in a contract. TV advertising. Okay. I'm sorry? I just said, ah, if you get it in the contract. Okay, I was wondering because well, I always assumed TV advertising was expensive. And a lot of people do. Um, TV is is becoming more and more of a dinosaur, and it's not there yet. Uh, the Internet has just been ta- overtaking. People are getting their news from their cell phones, their their tablets, their computers. They're, they're always connected to technology. And also with um, people suffering, I mean, cable is really having a, a, quite a fight with satellite TV. And... The thing is, there's, I mean, of course, it's cheaper down here, I'm sure, on Hatteras Island than it is in other places, but I'm sure that even in metropolitan, and like I do contracts differently. I have a yearly contract that I do that I know I'm going to do X amount of ads throughout the year, and I schedule it out for the year in advance. But also by getting, a, I want to run a promotion for a week. Um, it's amazing what you can get for $100 and $200, $300. And the thing is, if you're going to do something, and especially with TV advertising, own it. In other words, you can't just put one or two ads out there and go, shoo, I just spent a lot of money. The more you spend, the more ads you get, the cheaper the rate is going to be. And you want it to be that when the people turn on the TV, if they just turn the TV on a couple times a day, that they're going to see your ad. And if you're going to skimp out on something, do it on another medium, but don't do it on TV. Because you got to, people have to see you, and they can't just see your ad once. They have to see you multiple times before, you know. Oh, I recognize that ad, or I recognize that tune. Let me go see what the, what's what's running right now. Oh yeah, the event. It's three days away. No, it's two days away. Oh my gosh, it's tomorrow. So whatever you do, don't skimp out on that. You got to own that medium. Right. Um, could you give our listeners some information about how they might go about getting involved in TV advertising? What you know, are you advertising on cable? Uh, how are you doing it, and who would they contact if they wanted if they well, were interested in in doing that? Well, every market has a you know the, every market has a local branch. Um, And for us, you know, for Virginia, it's Cox TV. You know, down here, it's Charter. Um, And it's not hard. You know, you just basically, I mean, usually they're advertising reps that will be, you know, in your front door in 24 hours if you ask them to come out and and meet with them and discuss advertising. But every every town, every market has has, um, outlets. And I guess basically knowing what your local provider is for your area is to contact them. Right. And so you're, you're me, dealing with the uh, cable people rather than, let's say, a local network like ABC yes, or something cable. like but, that. You're, but you're dealing directly with the cable people. Yes, absolutely. Okay. All right, good. So um, can you tell me 